Welcome back. Because Republicans hold supermajorities in both the Florida House and the Florida Senate, Democrats have little to no clout. Nevertheless, they file their bills and argue for the things they think are important. The Democratic leader in the Florida House is Fentress Driscoll from Tampa. I asked her what issues she expects will dominate this year's legislative session. So it's interesting. The Republicans have really been keeping their cards close to the chest. I don't think we have a strong sense emerging from committee weeks what session is going to be about. You know, we did see the Live Healthy Act drop in the Senate, and we know that health care is going to be a, a big piece of, of what we talk about. But what a missed opportunity to have a big health care bill that doesn't mention expanding Medicaid at all. You know, Florida is one of only 10 states that has not expanded Medicaid. And so now we're sitting at the kiddies table with Alabama and Mississippi, when instead we could be focused on expanding high quality uh, health care access to Floridians um, who need it. And we know that expanding Medicaid would uh, cover at least another 800,000 Floridians. Um, we how many children? I, I, I was well, how many of the eight hundred thousand? How many of them would be children? It's a large number that would be children as well, correct? It is a large number that would be children, and I'll tell you. Even though I don't have the exact number, I know that it's a large number, and I'll tell you too. Um, in studying this over the summer, what I learned, Florida under DeSantis's leadership has been disenrolling just hundreds of thousands of people from Medicaid, and the majority of them have been children. And so as some of the federal funds dry up from the American Rescue Act and, and, and other things, um, we're going through a disenrollment process with, with Medicaid and not to get too into the weeds, um, the state has been disrolling people for purely technical reasons sometimes, not necessarily because they're no longer eligible and it's children who are being hurt the most. So when it comes to children uh, in, in the state of Florida and its Medicaid program, we don't have a very good track record. The Republicans don't have a very good track record of taking care of kids. And I think and I think it's really important to remind everyone that when we talk about Medicaid expansion, we're talking about bringing back to the state of Florida dollars that the state of Florida pays into the system, that these are federal dollars that would come into Florida that would be, you know, like would cover at least 90 percent, if not more, of the cost. And yeah. we've put hundreds of millions of dollars left in Washington that could come home to Florida. I've never, just to basically be able to say, we refuse to participate in a Washington program. That's exactly right. These are Floridians hard earned taxpayer dollars. And so what happens is it effectively renders Florida a donor state because you better believe that there are other states who are taking advantage of our taxpayer dollars and giving their own people health care. So it's been a frustration of mine and, and many in my caucus as to why Medicaid expansion has been made such a partisan issue by the Republicans. To me, it's an economic issue. Every Floridian has the freedom to be healthy, prosperous, and safe. And that certainly includes the, the right to have access to health care, especially when it's already our, our taxpayer dollars are already going towards the cost. And it's now not just health care. It's also food programs, correct? Like there's a, there's a federal grant that is available, $248 million, I think it is, for to feed hungry kids in the state of Florida that is not going to be accessed, that the Department of Children and Families says they are not going to apply for, even though they're entitled to that money? Yeah, and Jim, we've been tracking that too. And so the concern that you raise to me is a part of a broader conversation over what's been happening under DeSantis's leadership, where he is so focused on his own ambition and running for president and drawing absurd distinctions between him and President Biden that he won't accept, he won't allow the state to accept federal dollars that would actually help kids. And once again, as you pointed out earlier, these are dollars that taxpayers uh, in Florida are already paying into the system. There's no good logical reason for turning down that money, especially when we know that it would go towards feeding hungry kids. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, we, we both know and understand the reality of politics that the, both the House and the Senate have super majorities of Republicans. And so therefore, often ideas put forth by the Democratic Party and its representatives don't even get a hearing, let alone an actual vote. But you, nevertheless, the Democrats in the House do have an agenda that they want to put forward. Give me an idea of, of if you were able to put forth and get committee hearings going and those sorts of issues. What, what is the agenda that the Democrats would like to see the state of Florida take up and how would it benefit Floridians? You know, we want Floridians to be able to imagine a future where those who need health care have access to it. Imagine communities that are uh, free from gun violence or where gun violence is reduced. Imagine that there's housing affordability and that there really is 
that future where everyone has the freedom to be healthy, prosperous, and safe. These are the sorts of issues that we focus on in our agenda. It's not the culture war stuff. It's not that. I think Floridians have had enough of that. They want the legislature to get back to doing the work of the people, and that is what we propose. So you will see from us a bill that proposes a property insurance commission that focuses on putting some accountability and transparency in that industry, as opposed to what the Republicans have been doing, which includes giving $3 billion bailouts to the insurance industry. You'll see a bill on common sense gun ownership, not talking about removing a gun from a single lawful gun owner, but focusing on some of those common sense issues where Republicans, Democrats, and uh, independents agree that could help make our community safer. And you will certainly see a bill on Medicaid expansion because as I mentioned before, it's time to put aside partisan politics and do what's best for the people of the state of Florida. And that means bringing our taxpayer dollars back home and expanding access to, to healthcare. Uh, how frustrating is it that when you put forth these bills, likely none of them will actually get a hearing? <laughs> you know, it is very frustrating, but I always say that as Democrats, we've been in the minority for quite some time in Florida, and we know how to do this. We know how to push for accountability, transparency. We know how to make our voices heard. And it's my hope that through this legislative session, we'll be able to take that even more directly to the people and really paint the vision of what Florida would look like if we were in charge, if there were grownups in charge, because I think it would be just a healthier, better Florida for all of us. Uh, what's the anticipation of what it's going to be like when Governor DeSantis returns to the state after having lost in Iowa, if he does in fact lose and getting knocked out of the presidential race? What kind of a governor do we think he'll be after that? What's the, what's the talk around Tallahassee regarding that? Yeah, I think I'm of two minds on this issue because on the one hand, we certainly have seen DeSantis's power diminish, right? Like you look at the instance of the embattled Republican Party of Florida chair, Christian Ziegler. DeSantis was one of the first Republican elected officials to call for Ziegler to resign and he still hasn't. And so that lets you know that DeSantis's power is waning because if this had happened like a year ago or so, I don't think there would have been any question that Ziegler would have been forced out. On the other hand, maybe it's of none effect uh, whether he comes back weaker or, or you know, everything stay the same because they all agree on the same issues, right? Like the Republicans in the legislature and DeSantis agree on restricting abortion access. They agree on, you know, limiting access to Medicaid. They agree on these bills, uh, you know, to, to weaken child labor laws, you know, so they're lockstep with respect to policy. So in, in one sense, it doesn't really matter if he comes back weaker or stronger, it's still going to be a devastating session for the people of Florida. You mentioned Christian Ziegler. I haven't had a chance to speak to you since, since the scandal broke surrounding him. Uh, obviously, you know, we don't know if he'll be charged with a crime. There's certainly evidence that is contradictory. Uh, in terms of the, the alleged accuser's statements. Uh, but putting that aside, the scandal itself has been, you know, the talk of Tallahassee as well as the rest of the state. What's your take on what, what's happening with Christian Zeger and the Republican Party at this point? Well, I think that these are allegations that must be taken seriously, right? And, you know, in the end, it sends a message, I think, of what the Republican Party thinks about those who have been uh, victims of sexual assault and sexual abuse, the fact that he is uh, still there and they have not been able to get him to step down. But I know that the authorities will do their jobs uh, and, and conduct this investigation and we hope that they do it thoroughly so we can really find out what happened and what really is the truth. But it's become such a distraction to their party, the fact that he will not resign, you know, but my greatest concern in all of this, of course, is that they're very serious allegations of sexual assault and sexual abuse. And those must be um, you know, thoroughly investigated. And if there is found to be just cause, they must be prosecuted. A footnote to our conversation. If Florida were to expand Medicaid, more than 300,000 children will be eligible who currently have no health insurance. Also, with the start of the legislative session next week, I'll be heading up to Tallahassee where the state Senate is scheduled to hold a committee hearing on the treatment of the mentally ill in the criminal justice system. I'll be reporting from Tallahassee as part of our ongoing coverage of the crisis that started with our documentary Warehouse, The Life and Death of Tristan Murphy, and continued last week with the latest revelations out of the Broward County Jail. Now, when we come back, I'll be joined by my colleague, Betty Wynn, to discuss her exclusive interview with Elizabeth Shear, the judge who oversaw the Parkland shooting trial. That's right after the break.